and you don't have to copy all these dates on. I'm just doing this to kind of help you um, situate the kings and the action within Henry the Fourth, parts one, two, and Henry the Fifth. So, kind of briefly, I want to hit some major dates. <clears throat> 1367, which is when both Richard the Second and Henry Bolingbroke um, are born. Okay, Chaucer is alive at this time. He hasn't yet really begun um, writing. Okay, then we get death of Edward the Third and his grandson in at the age of ten. Richard the Second becomes king. Okay. Um, Prince Hal, that's who this Henry is, is born in 1386. Okay, then we see Mortimer born, 5th Earl of March. Okay, Richard II in 1398, so he's 31, banishes his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke. The reason he banishes him is because he's afraid of him, essentially. Okay? So Bolingbroke gets banished for 10 years, and at the same time, Richard declares that Edmund, this one, okay, will be his heir because Richard doesn't have any direct heirs himself. Right? Duke of Lancaster dies in 1398, and the Duke of Lancaster is pretty important. This guy's other name is John of Gaunt. Okay? He's the one for whom um, to whom, I should say, Chaucer writes uh, one of his earliest works, The Book of the Duchess, which is about the death of John of Gaunt's um, wife, Blanche. Okay? So his father dies in 1398. 1399, when he dies, okay, Richard seizes all of John of Gaunt or Duke of Lancaster's estates. Now, when he does that, what he's essentially doing is he's taking all of Henry's land. Keep in mind, Henry's been banished. He's outside England at this point. So now, Richard seizes all of that. That is the impetus for Henry Bolingbroke to come back to England. And the only reason, according to the play, Richard II, okay, the only reason he's coming back to England is to regain his lands. Okay? He's not coming back to seize the throne. Well, at least that's what he wants us to do. Okay? But pretty much as soon as he lands on English soil, all these people flock to his banner. Okay? And what happens? That October, Richard is deposed. Okay? Uh, he's off on a, on a um, battle against the Irish. So it's kind of a, a three-way fight as to who hates the English more, the Irish, the Welsh, or the Scots. They pretty much all have good reason to. Okay? So he's off getting ready to fight the uh, Irish, and Richard essentially has him arrested. And it's while he's in custody that Richard, uh, Henry has him arrested. It's while he's in custody that Richard dies. Henry is then crowned Henry IV. Okay. Chaucer dies also in this year. So, 1400, you get the death of Richard II. You have Owen Glendower, who we will see very quickly, defeats and captures um, Edmund Mortimer, uncle to Edmund, Earl of March. One of the things Shakespeare does in Henry IV, Part One, is he conflates these two. He makes them into a single character. Okay, there are two Mortimers. Shakespeare makes one out of them. Okay, Henry Percy, Hotspur, defeats the Scots at the Battle of Holmden. got to put pictures back on my computer. Okay, 
that is Alec. Uh, here is the there it is. This is a statue at um, and I want to get a better picture of the actual statue. It's there we go. That's pretty good. Um, of Henry Percy at Onnit Castle in Northumberland, um, England. When I do my Harry Potter course, uh, we always go up to this castle because it's the castle used for most of the exterior shots of Hogwarts and such. Um, I do that, and they've always got you know stupid Harry Potter, you know, flying lessons and you know, idiotic stuff like that. <laughs> I get the students there because it's an important castle. It's the largest, uh, second largest, continuously inhabited castle in England. It's been inhabited by the Percy family since the 13th century, late 1200s. The only castle that is larger and that has been inhabited longer is Windsor. Okay? This gives you an idea of how important the Percy family is. So keep that in mind as you read about Hotspur and Northumberland in the play. Northumberland is Hotspur's father. Okay? Uh, you go to the castle today, you walk around, you go to all the staterooms and stuff, you go in part of the private residence, you see the current Duke of Northumberland's table, and he's got pictures of his kids and everything. Because pretty much when, when the visiting hours are over, they take away the ropes and the family comes out of hiding if they're living there at the time. I keep telling my daughter she needs to marry the, the current Earl because he's in his 20s and he's not married because that would give us a nice place to go to. <laughs> um, back to this. Okay, so um, Henry Percy Hotspur defeats the Scots at the Battle of Holmby. And remember again what I said the other day. Henry Percy historically is more like the age of Henry IV. He could be Hal's father. But Shakespeare realizes it doesn't work well. Okay. I've got other foils for Henry IV. I need somebody to really be a good, strong foil for young Hal. And Hal is probably, well, he's born in 1386. So in 1402, how old is he? 16. So when the battle begins that we see opening here in 1403, Hal should only be about 19. Now if you watched any of the clip, any of the URL that I sent you last night, um, we're going to watch a little bit this morning. So we're going to get behind more than I want to be. Um, Tom Hiddleston plays Prince Hal. I don't know how old Tom Hiddleston is exactly, but he's not 19. And he doesn't look 19. In fact, I think he looks older than he is, because I think he's in his late 20s. But he looks about 30 or 35. Okay. So this essentially is, well, actually, let's say here. This is where Henry IV Part I begins. Glendower has just, or Glendower, has just captured, okay, Mortimer. Hotspur has just captured Douglas, the Scot, and a few others. So the play opens, and we have a council of war, okay? And I'm going to skip, well, actually, oh, this is, I'm going to get way behind. Um, That's how. Hold on a second. I want to make sure. I don't want to get all the credits and such. This is the problem I had last night. I put this on our big screen TV and it froze right in the middle of production. That's just false staff in bed. YouTube, she is a fickle mistress. YouTube is a fickle mistress. <sighs> 
Movie. Jeremy Irons plays Henry the Fourth. You may not know Jeremy Irons, but you probably know his voice if you ever saw The Lion King, because he plays Scar. Yep. This is how going up to Falstaff. stuff. It, oh, it's all stuff I want to skip. Okay, now this is the opening monologue by the king. What's that? More day, the art of fight. The earls of Atwell, of Murray, Angus, and Monteith. Well, is not this an honorable spoil? <laughs> a gallant prize. Actually, this is, a it is a conquest for a prince to about line 78 or so. Yeah. Now he talks about Hotspur. Makes me sin in envy that my lord Northumberland should be the father to so blessed a son. Whilst I, by looking on the praise of him, see riot and dishonor stain the brow of my young Harry. You know. This, this is a war council. Night tripping fairly did exchange and trade. He's got his advisors. And he goes off into this reverie about his wretched son. He is planted. Then would I have his hand? And he mine. But I pretty sweet wag. Shall there be gathers standing in Okay, we're gonna stop there. Pick up where we um where did we leave off? Is that where we left off? Yeah, we did only the first scene. Sheesh. Okay. It's the whole, it's all four. Okay? Right hand side over here, you've got Hollow Crown Part 2. That's, um, well, Richard II, the first of the plays in the Tetralogy. Then you have Henry IV Part 1. Somewhere over here is Henry IV Part 2. And then you have Henry V. So all four plays, this was part of the BBC's Cultural Olympiad to coincide with the Olympics um, this summer. I should take Tom Hiddleston off so that you ladies don't drool. Uh. Yeah, my daughter's like, ah, you know. Okay, <laughs> so we begin with this council of war. What happens in the very next scene? We're with Falstaff and Hal and Pwans and Pito and Bardolf, etc. Okay. At the bar slash pub slash whorehouse. It's what it is. Okay. So we open the play with the king talking about. I want to go, I want to launch this crusade, okay, and finding out that his plans are being ruined by this open rebellion, okay, and so he has a council of war. He says, I'm going to have Hotspur surrender his uh, prisoners to me, blah, 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 blah. Very next scene, what do we have? Okay, we have another kind of council. It's just not a council of war. It's a council of frivolity. It's a council of revelry. It's a council of um, debauchery. Okay, and I'm not going to talk a lot about this scene, but whereas in the first council we see plans for war. What do we see King C come up in this second council? 
plans for robbery. Okay? So we have plans for death and destruction, war, and possible death and destruction in robbery. Is the one somehow more noble than the other? I mean, the king is defending his land. He's defending his title. You can argue whether or not he should have that title because he did get it through rebellion. Okay. But that is still a little bit more noble than out and out thievery by a bunch of drunks, which is essentially what Falstaff, Pons, Peto, and Bardolph, etc. are. Okay. So we see this plan, we hear Pons tell. Um, how, what he wants to do, and then we get this passage where how, in the play, in the script as it's given us, how gives us a soliloquy, okay, which they treat slightly different in the film version. It's like they will know us by our habits and by every other appointment. To be this is him talking have, with Pons about to mask our noted out of guns. About the um, they will be too hard for us. Impending <laughs> well, robbery. Two, I know them to be as true about cowards as ever turned back. And for the third, if he fights along with the knee sees reason, I'll force wear arms. The virtue of this jest will be the incomprehensible lies the same fat rogue will tell us when we meet at some. Provide us all things necessary, and meet, and meet me here tomorrow night. Very well. Oh well, my lord. Can we lower those blinds? Might help. I know you all. No matter why I uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun. He doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world. And when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that had seemed to strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays to sport would be as tedious as to work, but when they seldom come, they wished for them. And nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So when this loose behavior I throw off and pay the debt I never promise it, by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes. And like bright metal on a sun ground, my reformation, glittering o'er my fault, shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I'll so offend, to make offence a skill, redeeming time when men think least I will. Okay, so what is Hal just said in that soliloquy? So I'm going to go back and forth with the lights again up a little bit. What has he just said in that speech? Okay, I mean, look at those last couple of lines. I'll so offend to make offense a skill, an art form, redeeming time when men think least I will. Okay, this, this raises some questions about Hal's character. Because what does that say then about Hal's entire friendship with Falstaff and such? Is he merely using them? So if he is, who is more Machiavellian? Hal or his father? Hal would be. He uses Falstaff, Pond, Peto, Bardolph, etc. as mere tools to do what? To tarnish his character so that when he does, as he says, throw off this habit 
Everyone will be amazed at him. Now we can almost skip everything else from here and go straight to Act 3, I think it is scene 1, when Hal has his interview with his father. And his father talks to him about Hal's communication with the people. And he doesn't mean his writing skills, his being on the TV and stuff. He means his being out in the open, seen every day. Okay? Because Henry IV tells us some things there about what he values and what he thinks are, are or is or are important. Okay? So we finish Act 1, Scene 2, and we go to Scene 3. And the king is talking, and he's addressing Worcester. Okay? And he asks Worcester... Why are you doing this? That's what his opening speech is. Worcester. Our house, my sovereign liege, little deserves the scourge of greatness to be used on it. And that same greatness to which our own hands have hope to make so portly. In other words, you are threatening us with your greatness. What is his greatness? He's the king. He said, you are threatening us, and we installed you. <clears throat> In other words, if it weren't for us, if it weren't for us, you wouldn't be king. Okay? You wouldn't have the position you have. How dare you? Okay? Danger and disobedience in thine eye. Worcester is saying, well, there's no danger in disobedience in us. No, your presence is too bold and peremptory. Sorry. Take that back. That's the king speaking. The king says, no, I see danger and disobedience in your eye. Okay? So he tells Worcester to leave. And I, again, I really encourage you to watch this version because it's very well done. Okay? And then he addresses Northumberland, Hotspur's father, and says, I want the prisoners. And then he addresses Hotspur, or Hotspur addresses him. And look at what Hotspur says. And this is one of the things I like about this production. Because I've seen several productions of Henry IV Part I. And they have Hotspur and Northumberland speak in essentially a London dialect. No. Hotspur and Northumberland need to speak in a northern dialect. Almost Scots. Okay? And so what does Hotspur do? He says, no, I didn't deny any prisoners, but the guy who came to me came demanding prisoners. And how did the person speak and look? A what? Effeminate. He's a fop. He's dressed as a dandy. He's sitting here putting stuff to his nose, snuff to his nose, and he's offended because... Hotspur's men have been dragging the dead bodies between himself and the wind. And he is offended by the smell of death. Hotspur, meanwhile, is what? In the scene that Hotspur is talking about, he's bleeding, he's sweaty, he's bloody, and the guy saying, send your prisoners? What Hotspur is attempting to say is, I just ignored him. I didn't deny you prisoners. Right? So Blunt says to the king, you know, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And the king replies, but he does deny his prisoners. Why does the king say that? Hotspur hasn't brought them with him. In other words, he is denying me his prisoners. Where are they? Okay. And how does he deny them? With proviso and exception. In other words, he has a list of excuses. Okay? So they go on back and forth. And the king refers to Mortimer as revolted Mortimer. Why does he call him revolted? What is the king saying Mortimer has done? He has rebelled. He is now in league with Glendower. Why does the king say this? What has Mortimer done? 
Okay, he went and quote-unquote got himself captured. Whether or not he's actually captured is open to interpretation. He married Glendower's daughter. That's not the mark of someone who is a prisoner. Okay? So Percy Hotspur launches into this long diatribe against the king. And the king says, Thou dost be lying, Percy. About line 113. Sorry, my old phrase. Thou dost belie him, Percy, thou dost belie him. He never did encounter with Glendur. I tell thee, he durst as well have met the devil alone as Owen Glendur for an enemy. Art thou not ashamed? Send me your prisoners, what? Or you shall hear in such a kind from me as will displease you. Okay? I will require it of you. Hotspur. I'm not going to. Hotspur, Northumberland, leave, etc., and notice in this long passage from around line 130, or oh really to the end of that act, what are Northumberland and Worcester trying to do with Hotspur? Calm him down. Okay? Now, what did the king call Hotspur earlier in that one speech? The theme of honor's tongue. In other words, he says, Hotspur is the embodiment of honor, of chivalry, of true knightliness. And that's why he says, I wish I could exchange my son for his. Right? So then we see this long passage where Hotspur is going back and forth with Northumberland and Worcester and what are Northumberland, I already said, Northumberland and Worcester are trying to get him to calm down. And finally, <clears throat> we hear, um, trying to find. Actually, it's another scene I'm thinking of. Hotspur on um, page 794, line 227. As they're still talking, Worcester is going to reveal to Hotspur a plot. But just before he does, Hotspur says, All studies here I solemnly defy, save how to gall and pinch this bowling broke and that same sword and buckler Prince of Wales, but that I think his father loves him not and would be glad he met with some mischance, I would have him poisoned with a pot of ale. When he says, all studies here I solemnly defy, it's almost like he's channeling Hamlet from later in Shakespeare's works. Because Hamlet says, after he has the meeting with the ghost, all saws and laws in books I hear wipe clean from the table of my mind. Why? Because he's going to imprint one thing on his mind. Kill Claudius. This is Hotspur saying, I've got one idea and one idea only. Oppose Bolingbroke. And notice he calls him by his name. He doesn't call him the king. Okay? So, Worcester goes on and talks to Hotspur in Northumberland. There's the passage I was looking for. Northumberland says to Hotspur, Why, what a wasp stung and impatient fool art thou to break into this woman's mood, trying thine ear to no tongue but thine own. What does that mean? Trying thy ear to no tongue but thine own. Exactly. He won't listen to anybody else. So Hotspur is a major foil. He's a foil for Falstaff. Okay. He's a foil for Hal. 
He and Falstaff are exact opposites. Where is Hal? He's in the middle. Okay? Craftier, more considered, more considerate, more thoughtful than either. Hotspur flies off, you know, at the handle. Hal doesn't. Hal deliberates very much like Hamlet. Okay? Um, go to 2, Act 2. And we see the carrier come in with the lantern. And the Chamberlain, Gad's Hill, Act 2, Scene 2. We see the robbery at Gad's Hill. Don't conf get confused. There's a place called Gad's Hill, Gad's Hill, two words. And there's a character named Gadzel. Gad's Hill, one word. Okay? So we see the robbery, and then we see Hal and Pawns set upon Falstaff. And it's done pretty well in the version I gave you. And then we're taken immediately to Hotspur. So we get Hotspur, the end of Act 1, Hal, and Falstaff, and Pawns, and all those, the beginning of Act 2, and then Hotspur again. Notice Hal gets sandwiched by Hotspur. Okay? And we see Hotspur and his wife, and Lady Percy's essentially saying what to Hal? Excuse me, Hotspur. That'd be an awkward situation. <laughs> Why have you foregone my bed these two weeks? What's going on? Something must be afoot. She doesn't know about their open rebellion. Okay? Then we go back to Hal. So we see this disorder in society... How else would you describe a robbery than a disorder in society? And then we see kind of a disorder in marriage. And marriage slash family is the root element of society. And then we go back to Hal, okay? In scene two, uh, act two, scene four. It's one of the longest scenes in all of the play. What do we see in that entire scene? Why does Shakespeare spend so much time on that? We see Falstaff undone, don't we? Falstaff talks about the robbery, and Hal and Pons are, are kind of egging him up. Really? And, and how many were there? And he starts with four men in... Um, I don't remember the color he uses, but later on he's going to add, and he's going to say these others were in Kindle Green. And we see four, jump up to six, jump to seven, jump to nine, jump to 11. And Hal and Pons are sitting there going back and forth. Watch, he's going to keep going up, up, up. Until finally, um, Hal addresses him and says... Line 251, page 802. <clears throat> we too saw you four set on four and bound them and were masters of their wealth. Mark now a plain tale shall put you down. Then did we too set on you four and with a word I faced you from your prize and have it yea and can show it you here in the house. And Falstaff, you carried your guts away as nimbly with his quick dexterity and roared for mercy and still run and roared as ever I heard bull calf. You ran, Hal is essentially saying, before we could even touch you with swords. And he says, and we can prove it because we have the money that you stole. Okay? And Falstaff essentially says, we knew it was you. Right, guys? Okay. And Hal allows him to save face that way. Why? Is this all part of Hal's act of putting on the, the character of a debauched prince? No. Because Hal really does love Falstaff. 
Hal has two fathers in the play. He has his real father, and then he has another father, a father figure. Why does he need Falstaff? Yeah, describe Henry IV. Cold? Calculating? Though you are going to see, because I'm going to show you the scene, when he has his interview with Hal. And Jeremy Irons just hits this out of the park, I think. He nails it. Okay. Henry IV isn't entirely cold and calculating. He does care for Hal in Prince John. Okay. So while they're inside the house of ill repute, let's say, and they're joking and laughing, etc., what happens? There's a knock on the door. And Hal is told, you're to the king tomorrow. <laughs> you, you have to go to the court. Okay? And Falstaff says, um, Harry Percy, up north, there, there's a rebellion afoot. And they talk about Glendower and Mortimer. So Falstaff says, Worcester is stolen away tonight, line 354. Thy father's beard is turned white with the news. That means Henry is worried. You may buy land now as cheap as stinking mackerel. Why? Because war is about to break out. It's not good for land prices. So Falstaff says, aren't you afraid? I mean, they've got the Douglas. It's the name of a single warrior, but he, inspir he inspires fear in the heart of everyone who hears his name. They've got the Douglas lined up with them. They've got Owen Glendower, who's supposed to be a magician, who's supposed to conjure devils out of the ground. Okay. They've got Worcester. They've got Mordlake. They've got Harry Percy. They've got Northumberland. The king doesn't have nearly as many. Aren't you afraid, Hal? Hal. Not a wit. <laughs> I lack some of thy instinct. What is he saying is Falstaff's instinct? To run. Fear yeah. to run. Falstaff, well, thou wilt be chid horribly tomorrow when thou comest to thy father. If thou love me, practice an answer. That is, rehearse for me what you're going to say. Falstaff, okay. Pretend to be my father. And I ought to put this on here. It's a great scene. Watch it. It's a fantastic scene. They set a big chair up on top of the one of the benches, and Falstaff sits on it. And Falstaff is hugely, grossly fat. He puts a cushion on his head to be his crown, and then he puts a pot on top of that. Okay? And he addresses Hal. And Hal replies. And then Hal says, let me play my father and you portray me. Okay. So Hal takes his place. And Hal, as the king, that is pretending to be the king, says, line 440, 440, Swearest thou, ungracious boy, henceforth ne'er look on me, thou art violently carried away from grace. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. A ton of man is thy companion. Why dost thou converse with that trunk of humors, that bolting hutch of beastliness, that swollen parcel of dropsies, that huge bombard of sack, that stuffed cloak bag of guts, that roasted manning tree ox? Okay. Now, how's pretending to be the king? Is maybe how speaking a little bit of truth here? False. Go ahead. He, uh, he is happy to just go on and on. Yeah, he, he doesn't stop. He doesn't pull any punches. Okay. And false stuff. Yes, I know the man. But he's none of these things. To say I know more harm in him than in myself or to say more than I know. 
Notice that wonderful punning there. This is where, this is why I think Shakespeare should be required, not just an option for English majors. Okay? To say I know more harm in him than in myself. Now, this is false staff pretending to be hell, but it is still false staff talking. Is to say more than I know. That he is old, the more the pity. His white hairs do witness it. But that he is, saving your reverence, a whore master, that I utterly deny. If sack and sugar be a fault, God help the wicked. Why? Because that's he saying what the wicked survive on. If to be old and merry be a sin, then many an old host that I know is damned. False steps taking, taking Howell's works and saying, you know, to be old and to love life, if that's a sin... <laughs> then let he who is without sin cast the first stone, essentially. And if to be fat, to be hated, then Pharaoh's lean kind are to be loved. The story of Joseph and the dreams. How many of us want to be, not thin, anorexic? Nobody. Okay. No, my good Lord. Banish Peto. And you got to imagine Peto sitting over there going, what the hell? <laughs> Banish Bardolph. Banish Pawns. But for sweet Jack Falstaff, kind Jack Falstaff, true Jack Falstaff, valiant, valiant Jack Falstaff. And therefore, be more valiant, being as he is old Jack Falstaff, banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish not him, thy Harry's company. Why does he say it twice? He really, he really means it. Don't banish me from Harry. Banish plump Jack. And banish all the world. And look at Hal's reply. I do. Who is Hal pretending to be? The king. I will. When he says, I will, that is how speaking in his own voice. The end of Henry IV, part two. And you have scenes in Henry V. Okay, um, we'll watch some scenes of it. I don't know that we'll watch this one. We might, might, might watch Kenneth Branagh's, because Kenneth Branagh's is just superb, um, where you see flashbacks from the earlier plays. Okay? Because Hal, as king, is going to be forced to do some things he wouldn't do as prince. Little clue here. He's going to have to execute one or two of his friends because they're thieves. And they're thieving when the king said no thieving. Okay? So, the sheriff comes in, and he says he's looking for an old fat man. Hal says, I know who you're looking for. He's not here. I sent him off on some work. Falstaff has meanwhile fallen asleep, and they pick his pockets. They take what he has out, because this is going to be used against him later. So, we get Act 3, Scene 1. And if you've never really had Shakespeare before, Act 3, Scene 1 is almost always a pivotal scene. Really important stuff turns or occurs in this scene. And so we see Hotspur, Glendower, Mortimer, Worcester, Northumberland. Okay. And what do we see Hotspur doing? How does he address Owen Glendower? Or I'll use the pronunciation everybody uses. Glendower. He challenges him. What does Glendower say happened when he was born? The earth shook. The sky was on fire. There were portents galore. And Hal says, no there weren't. Excuse me, Hotspur says, no there weren't. Or if they were. Listen to what he says. 
Uh, about line 24 or so on page 806. Glendower. The heavens were all on fire. The earth did tremble. Oh, then the earth shook to see the heavens on fire, and not in fear of your nativity. Disease of nature oftentimes breaks forth in strange eruptions. Off the teeming earth is with a kind of colic, pinched and vexed by the imprisoning of unruly wind within her womb, which, for enlargement striving, shakes the old beldam earth and topples down steeples and moss-grown towers. In other words, the earth quakes, but to do what? To use a phrase that's used in more polite company, the earth quakes to break wind. Mm. The earth farted, is what Hotspur is saying, at Glendower's birth. <laughs> now, Glendower thinks all these portents portended his magnanimous coming. Glendower, cousin, of many men I do not bear these crossings. Give me leave to tell you once again that at my birth the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes. The goats ran, sorry, I broke into a Scots accent, ran, ran from the mountains and the herds were strangely clamorous to the freighted fields. These signs have marked me extraordinary. Hotspur, not really. Okay, and so what do the others do? Quit. Mortimer says, I warn you, no other man could get away with what you've just done and live. Okay. So, they break off that, and we see Mortimer and his beautiful Welsh wife, and she's singing to him, why? Because the Welsh are supposed to have the greatest voices in the world, etc. And we go to Act 3, Scene 2. I'm trying to see if I remember where this is. <coughs> This is all the big long scene. That's where Hal is praying, playing the king. It's when he's broken up by the sheriff. Okay. He's making his way to the king. Notice the swagger. He's kind of cocky. Getting this on my recording too. <laughs> okay, let me pause this for just a second. Actually, I'm going back just a hair. In the scene where Hal plays the part of the king, Falstaff kind of stands back from the table a little bit. And Hal does this. Signals him to come forth. And I'll watch. Watch what the king does and look at Hal's face. smirk. In fact, he knows his father's mannerisms perfectly. And he did do a pretty good Jeremy Irons impersonation. The Prince of Wales and I must have some private comfort. No. The boys off to the side are Hal's younger brothers. So the king wants to see, wants Hal to be seen by them. And wants them to see Hal's getting his you-know-what chewed off. I 
and I know whether God will have it so for some displeasing service I have done, that in his secret doom, out of my blood, he'll breed revengement and a scourge for me to punish my mistreadings. <laughs> Tell me else, could such inordinate and low desire, such poor, such bare, such lewd, such mean attempt, such barren pleasures, rude society, as thou art mashed with all and grafted to accompany the greatness of thy blood. Hold their level with thy princely heart. So please, your majesty. Thy place in council thou hast rudely lost, which by thy younger brother is supplied, and art almost an alien to the heart of all the courts, princes of my blood. The hope of thy time is ruined. And the soul of every man prophetically doth forthink thy fall. Had I so lavish in my presence been so stale and cheap to vulgar company, opinion that it helped me to the crown had left me in repute as banishment, a fellow of no mark nor likelihood. By being seldom seen, I could not stir, but like a Comet, I was wondered at that men would tell their children, This is he. And then I stole all courtesy from heaven to dress myself in such humility that I did pluck allegiance from men's hearts, loud shouts and salutations from their mouths. The skippy king, he ambled up and down with. Which is the second. Jesters of rash barren wits mingled his royalty with capering fools and feeded himself to popularity. So when he had occasion to be seen, he was but as the cuckoo was in June. Heard, not regarded. And in that very line, Harry, standest thou. For thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile communication. Not an eye, but is a weary of thy common sight, save mine, which hath desired to see me more, which now doth that I would not have it to make blind itself with foolish tenderness. Notice the dynamic going on here. I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious lord, be more myself. <laughs> He really struck him. Yeah. <laughs> for all the world, as thou art to this hour, was Richard then when I from France set foot of Ravenspur. And even as I was then, is Percy now. He hath more worthy interest to the state than thou, the shadow of succession. For of no right nor colour like to it, he hath filled fields with harness in the realm. And being no more in debt to yours than thou, leads ancient lords and reverend bishops on to bloody battles and to bruising arms. Thrice hath this hot spur, Mars in swaddling clothes, this infant warrior, in his enterprises discomfited great Douglas, taming once, enlarged him, made a friend of him, to fill the mouth of deep defiance up and shake the peace and safety of our crown. Wherefore do I tell these news to thee? Hmm? Why, Harry, do I tell thee of my foes, which art my nearest and dearest enemy? Yeah. Thou that art like enough through vassal fear, base inclination, and the start of spleen to fight against me on a Percy's pay. Do not think so. You shall not find it so. I will redeem all this on Percy's head, and in the closing of some glorious day be bold to tell you that I am your son, and that shall be the day, whene'er it lights, that this same child of honour and renown, this gallant hotspur, this all-praised knight, and your unthought-of Harry chance to meet. Then will I make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. This in the name of God, I promise here. And I will die a hundred thousand deaths ere break the smallest parcel of this vow.
hundred thousand rebels die in this. I shall take charge of the sovereign trust. Hear it? Watch your eyes. Uh, Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Pretty powerful scene, right? Harry is upbraided, or Hal is upbraided by his father. And then he gently upbraids his father. Not upbraids him by saying, you know, well, they've got good cause for the rebellion because you're a rebellious person too, blah, blah, blah. But he upbraids him by saying, you're wrong in what you think of me. How else can his father think of him based upon his actions? Okay. Did you, I mean, did you catch the little part when Henry begins to break down because he says, I haven't seen you enough. Which is when Hal says, hereafter I shall be more myself. And then gets smacked across the face. Because he has that little Tom Hiddleston smirk. Okay, you know, like Loki picking, you know, peeking through. Okay. <laughs> so, the, uh, Hal finishes with those lines. And then, they didn't include it at that section. But that scene ends with the king saying... Here's what we're going to do. He says, The Earl of Westmoreland set forth today with him, my son, Lord John of Lancaster, for this advertisement at five days old. Wednesday next, Harry, you shall set forward, etc., etc. And then what do we see? Shakespeare does this throughout. We go back to Falstaff. Okay. Again, because Shakespeare is juxtaposing matters of great seriousness with not so much. Okay. Falstaff is supposed to be a humorous character. He is a clown of sorts, but he's more than that. Okay. I mean, just for a moment, think of his name. He's Sir John Falstaff. He's a fallen staff. Okay? The staff should be upright. He's lost his glory. He's lost his honor. He's lost his nobility, even though he's a sir. Okay? And in the, I don't know if I've got it marked or not. In the um, play, there is a reference to an old something of. So another word to describe castle. Okay. In an earlier version of the play, or in an earlier version that Shakespeare bases the play on, there is reference to a Sir John Oldcastle, who was a real character, a real person, a knight who had kind of fallen from glory. Okay, so we see this long scene, uh, well, not too long, uh, Act 3, Scene 3, between mostly Falstaff and the hostess. The hostess is Mistress Quickly. Now, it's probably on the basis largely of this scene that Queen Elizabeth is reported to have said, to Shakespeare, I want to see more of Falstaff. Okay? And I want to see him in a comedy. And Shakespeare writes The Merry Wives of Windsor, which are largely about Falstaff and Mistress Quickly, and Falstaff trying to get into bed with a variety of different women of the town of Windsor. Okay? We won't, I don't think that I've got that on the syllabus. Um, but we won't talk about any more than that. So, the prince comes in, the prince tells Falstaff and Pons and Peto and Bartolf, you know, what is afoot? And he gives them orders. 
He tells Falstaff he has to raise 300 foot, that is, 300 infantry soldiers. He gives pawns duty to give him to get horses. He gives has uh, news for Bardolf to take to his brother John, etc. Okay, and we go to Act Four. We won't get done, but we'll get almost done because there's not much more to this play. Act Four. We go back to Hotspur. Okay, and Hotspur is talking with Douglas. And look at Douglas's first words to Hotspur in this act. Line 10. Thou art the king of honor. Okay, now keep in mind, what did King Henry tell Hal about Hotspur in that previous interview? What did Hal, excuse me, what did Hotspur do to slash for Douglas? He defeated him in battle, and then what? Gave him his freedom. He says, enlarged him and bound him to him. He didn't bind him through fear or threats. He bound him through Douglas's sense of honor. And the Douglas swore to Hotspur, like a vassal would to a knight. Okay. It's kind of significant because we're going to see Hal do the exact same thing at the end of the play. Simply not to get the Douglas to swear honor to or loyalty to Hal. But because he says, you know, this greatness of spirit, even though it is in the wrong side, should still be acknowledged. Okay? So we see the same... Um, the scene play out, and we find out on page 814, Northumberland won't be coming. So Percy's father will not be coming with additional troops. And then what do we hear? Neither will Mortimer and Glendower. Okay? And Hotspur says... Top of page 815, left-hand column. Um, men must think, if we without his help can make a head to push against the kingdom with his help, we shall return it topsy-turvy down. It all goes well. All our joints are whole. Douglas, there is not such a word spoke of in Scotland as this term of fear. In other words, we don't even know the word fear. Okay? Hotspur goes on. Vernon says, the king is even ridden forth. That's meant to inspire some awe. And he says, and his son too. Hotspur, where is his son, the nimble-footed nimble madcap prince of Wales? Okay. And Vernon gives a description of Prince Henry. All furnished, all in arms, all plumed like estrages. That with the wind baited like eagles, having lately bathed, glittering in golden coats, like images as full of spirit as the month of May. I saw young Harry with his beaver on, that is, his helmet. His quizzes on his thighs, gallantly armed, rise from the ground like feathered mercury. In other words, he arose like a god, and vaulted with such ease into a seat as if an angel dropped down from the clouds to turn and wind a fiery pegasus and witch the world with noble horsemanship. Hotspur, stop, please. Come, 119. Let me taste my horse. It doesn't mean he's going to eat it. He means let me feel my horse underneath me who is to bear me like a thunderbolt against the bosom of the Prince of Wales. Like a thunderbolt? Well, Vernon has used godlike imagery to describe Harry. So Hotspur is going to use godlike imagery of his own. Like a thunderbolt. Who's the chief god in the Greek or Roman pantheon? Zeus, the god of thunder. Okay. 
And then Vernon says, oh, by the way, I heard Worcester can't make it. Not for 14 days. Hotspur, fine, he says. Let it be 40. My father and Glendower being both the way, the powers of us may serve so great a day. Hotspur man is just itching for a fight. And he thinks the fewer we have on our side to win this battle, the more glory there will be for us. Just like the last play in the sequence, Henry V, Henry V's speech on St. Crispin's Day. Okay? We'll see that when we look at it later. So then we go to Falstaff with Bardolph. And I was going to look at the passage, but it's too long. But look at Falstaff's speech on page 816. What kind of troops has he pressed into war? Okay, the, the, the king's press is, was this practice where a man of the king, that is a man who's given license by the king, can go around to towns and villages and press men into war. That means essentially they arrest them. And they force them to go to war. Okay? What kind of men has Falstaff gotten? Somewhat like himself. The poor? The lame? The frail? The weak? The old? The hungry. Why? Why? Because he says, after the prince rides up, and the prince in Westmoreland address him, Falstaff says, line 64, tut tut, good enough to toss, Food for powder, food for powder. Isn't that what men in war are, according to Falstaff? Merely fodder. They're expendables. They'll fit a pit as well as better. Tish, man. Mortal men, mortal men. In other words, they'll die as good as any other. Doesn't matter. Aye, but Sir John, methinks they are exceeding poor and bare, too beggarly. Faith for their poverty, I know not where they had that. And for their bareness, I am sure they never learned that of me. He saying, it's not my fault they're poor. It's not my fault they're bare. So what has Falstaff really done with the money he was given to raise a troop of 300? Okay. So we get Act 4, Scene 3. And Blunt comes to Hotspur's camp. And Blunt asks, what is the nature of your grief? What is the problem? The king wants to know. And, Fa and Hotspur launches into this long polemic. Okay? And he essentially says, how came the king to be king were it not for my father? And my uncle, and my brother. He says, and yet the king treats us not as equals, not as kingmakers. Okay? No, what did the king do? He proceeded farther, further, line 87. Cut me off the heads of all the favorites that the absent king in deputation left behind him uh, here when he was personal in the Irish war. Blood, I came not to hear this. Then to the point, he deposed the king. Yeah, but he did it with Percy's father's acceptance and agreement. Soon after that, he deprived him of his life. And in the neck of that, tasked the whole state. And he's taken the kingship. And my brother, Mortimer, should be king. Okay? Blood. Do you really want me to give this answer to the king? Because what's the answer? Open rebellion. You, you don't want to think about this, Hotspur. Says, no, no, wait. 
we'll send word in the morning. Okay? So we get Act 4, Scene 4, which, which Archbishop, this is Scroop, etc. And Sir Michael. And then we get Act 5. And in Act 5, Worcester and Vernon come. Now keep in mind... Worcester is the first of the knights that the king banishes from his presence. He says, get out of my sight. When I have need of you, I will send for you. So Worcester comes. And Worcester says, we were the first, line 33, and dearest of your friends. For you, my staff of office, did I break in Richard's time. To meet you on the way, that is, to meet you when you came back from your exile. And it was with our help that you were welcomed and that you became king. And the king says, yeah, you've already said this. You've said these things at the towns and the marketplaces throughout the kingdom. And so the prince intervenes. What does the prince offer to the rebellious forces. And why does he offer it? Line 87. He says, um, tell your nephew. The Prince of Wales does join all the world in the praise of Henry Percy. By my hopes, this present enterprise set off his head. I do not think a braver gentleman, more active, valiant, or more valiant young, more daring, or more bold, is now alive to grace this latter age with noble deeds. So he's just praised Hotspur, and then he says, Tell your nephew, I'll challenge him to single combat. Why? To stop the bloodshed. He doesn't want so many people on the, re on the rebel side to die. He doesn't want so many people on his own side to die. To save the blood on either side, try fortune with him in a single fight. And the king doesn't disavow that. But what does the king offer? Total amnesty. Okay? Total amnesty. He says, no, good Worcester, no. We love our people well. Even those we love that are misled upon your cousin's part. And will they take the offer of our grace, both he and they and you, yea, every man? Because I think when he says, and you, Worcester gives him this look like, please, don't lie to my face. And that's why the king says, yea, every man shall be my friend again and I'll be his. Tell your cousin, bring me word what he will do. Which is why when they leave, Worcester and Vernon decide to do what? What do they not tell Hotspur? The king has forgiven all. Why? Do they want so many people to die? So what motivates Worcester? He tells us with his last speech. Fear of his own life. In other words, he doesn't trust Henry. Now you can argue whether or not he trusts, whether or not he should trust him. Okay? And I think Shakespeare wants us to debate that. Whether Henry the Fourth is trustworthy. He did, after all, depose and kill the previous king. Okay? But is there anything in the lines that the king says here that Give us credence to believe that he's not being honest. No, there's not. So, Worcester and Vernon go tell Hotspur that the king is set to fight them. And then Vernon goes on and says, oh, and by the way, the prince challenged you to single combat. And he's like, what? 
Was he in contempt? That is, was he making fun? Was he mocking me? No. <laughs> By my soul. Line 51. I never in my life did hear a challenge urged more modestly unless a brother should a brother dare to gentle exercise and proof of arms. He gave you all the duties of a man, trimmed up your praises, spoke your deservings, making you ever better than his praise by still dispraising praise valued with you. And he acted like a prince indeed. What's he saying? I think Vernon is saying, Beware Prince Harry. Watch out for him. Okay. We get Act 5, Scene 4. The battle has started already. Blunt is killed. And Falstaff stumbles across Sir Walter Blunt's body. And Falstaff's running. He fears what's happening. I fear the shot here. Here's no scoring but upon the pate. And yes, he is punning on the meaning of the word, or the phrase, to score. It had the same meaning in the Renaissance as it has today, meaning having sex. Here's no scoring but upon the pate. But soft, who are you, Sir Walter Blunt? There's honor for you. Here's no vanity. And then he thinks about his men. There's not three of my hundred and fifty left alive. Whose fault is that? It's Falstaff's. He was supposed to be leading them. Okay. Prince runs into Falstaff, begs for his sword and such. The king is cornered by Douglas, and Harry rescues the king. And then Harry and uh, Hotspur battle. And they each have to say their words. You don't have to prove themselves. And they fight, and Douglas fights with Falstaff, who falls as if he were dead. They don't do this in the film. Okay. They completely leave out Douglas fighting with Falstaff. The very fact that Douglas fights with Falstaff shows us what about Falstaff? He's not completely devoid of honor. Okay, Though he does fall as if dead. So he, <laughs> mostly devoid of honor, but... Okay. And Harry kills Hotspur, and Hotspur says, Oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles as one of me. Okay? And he dies with his last words being, No, Percy, thou art dust and, dust and food for... And Hal says for worms, brave Percy. Now, is this Shakespeare saying this is what honor will get you? Because what does Hotspur live for? Honor. And now he's food for worms. We could go straight from here to Act 5, Scene 1 of Hamlet. The grave digging scene. Which is all about what happens when you die. And about what is the purpose and meaning of life. But we won't. Okay? Hal goes on and he sings Hotspur's praises. He says, this kingdom was too small for you. Your body was too small for your spirit, he says. But now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears thee dead bears not alive so stout a gentleman. Okay? And then Hal sees Falstaff and he's saddened. And I know my time is up. <laughs> so we'll stop there. We'll pick up with um, these very last few words on whatever the day it is, Tuesday.